Hey guys, Matt Fay here from Your Narrative. Um, again, I just want to welcome you all to the episode, whether you're listening in your car or you're watching the, um, the YouTube versions. I um, want to thank you all for, for tuning in wherever you are. And uh, look, it's my pleasure to be here with Jack Corbett today. Thanks for coming on board, Jack. No problems at all. Thank Jack, you for coming along. No, that's, that's fine, mate. Um, you know, Jack, the, the shark tamer, Corbett, I should, I should probably be referring to you as now, which we'll, which we'll get into shortly. But um, mm. look, uh, yeah, Jack Jack runs um, ISR Training, a, um, a sales and um, training organisation on the on the Gold Coast. And uh, yeah, look, mate, why don't you introduce yourself to everyone? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, my name's Jack Corbett. I'm just turned 27 years of age. I'm actually from Birmingham in the UK um, and I am the co-founder and managing director of ISR Training which is a practical sales training organisation and also the co-founder and CEO of Corbwood and Associates which is an investment property advisory group. Excellent mate and um, for those of you that might have might have been watching or listening on um, episode one that we actually had Ryan Tuckwood your business partner you did. on and um, that was a that was a great um, great episode that he did gave, gave a, a heap of value which I'm sure you will today. I hope so. And uh, like the thing you guys have got in common, you both from the UK. We are, come yeah, over yeah. From, from from there, so why yeah. don't you tell me about that, mate? Where did it all begin, and and what's what's the story? For sure, I mean, for me, um, life began just outside of England's second biggest city, um, which is called Birmingham. I grew up in a place called Worcester, um, or Worcestershire. It's about forty five minutes um, outside of Birmingham. Um, I met Ryan over here though, funnily enough, although we grow, grew up about 50 minutes apart from one another, sort of south side of Brisbane to the north side of the Gold yeah. Coast would be the, the distance between us. Um, we met each other playing for Broad Beach Football Club. Um, so both avid football players and football watchers. He's really good, I'm not. I'm very average um, at football, but um, that was where we, we'd met each other and um, found that we had a lot in common. Um, both family people, it was really important to us. Um, both very ethical people. We really wanted to try and deliver high quality products and services to our community. And we were both fantastic at talking. Um, and we thought, okay, there's a lot in common here. Um, We've got a good social relationship. Would that conform to a professional relationship? And it did. He came and worked for me. Um, I had a software white labeling company back in 2013. He came and worked for me as my sales manager. Um, we hit it off and when I sold that business, I had a non-approach agreement. So for 12 months, I wasn't allowed to contact Ryan. Although I would see him every Saturday at football, we just didn't ever breach the contract. And on the 366th day, I called him. I said, come on, boy, let's, um, let's have a little look at what our partnership could look like in a business movement forward and that's where ISR was born. Awesome mate, that's, yeah. a, that's a great, um, it's just a great story just to hear that you know you guys were over there, didn't didn't cross paths but came nope. over here and, and yep. it sounds like it was meant yep. to be. Yep. And just on that, like you were saying how you guys sort of hit it off and um, saw a lot in common, did you, you know, you approached him on that 366 day that you yes. said, did, did you know sort of early on that look, this is a guy that maybe I could do some business with? For sure, I had him I guess on my target list or my headhunt list if you will. Um, we'll get into it the more we talk through this, but when I sold my business, um, being a millionaire was the only thing I've ever wanted in my life. I grew up my whole life, my family had little to nothing, we grew up with you know, the, the fundamental basics, growing up on housing commission around a lot of sort of small-minded people you know, that couldn't see past the end of their own nose. So for me, I wanted to have a million dollars, I wanted to have a million dollars. And then I was fortunate enough to go and sell a business. I was able to achieve this macro life goal, but then I fell into a massive bout of depression. Wow. The next nine months of my life, from the February to the November, I didn't work. Mm -hmm. I was fat, bored, lonely, disengaged. I had no direction. I had no purpose in life anymore. And it was the moment I realized that Money is just one component of happiness. Mm. You know, money alone will not make a human being happy. It just won't. You need to find your fulfillment intrinsically, and then the money can add to that. You yeah. know, so um, I think Ryan saved my life. Ryan came and wanted to start a business when I approached him after 366 days. For that nine nine month period where I didn't work. I had just been designing businesses, so you know, I had my garage, I have whiteboards all over the wall, and I just started mind mapping businesses, and I actually designed six businesses. I then invited Ryan to my garage to come in and look at my shop of businesses he could potentially buy an equity stake from me, um, and I was very fortunate that he liked the model of ISR, it, it related to what he want his passions and what he wanted to do. He purchased, at that time, it was a 42.5% equity stake from me. Um, 
and we said, well, come on, let's do it. You know, yeah. let's make this happen. So um, we then went into strategy for about three months. And in the March of 2015, March the 26th, 2015 to be exact, we, we made our first sale and ISR was official. Awesome. We were a business. And so that, that nine months, I mean, that must have been a, a heck of a ride. Like, like you said, achieving those things, but then realizing it was the thing that you didn't want to achieve, but still it maybe not was what you thought it was going to be. No how, way. How did you handle that? Um, not very well. Not very well. I guess it's kind of like when you've set your sights on having something your whole life and you've obsessed over it, and then when you get it, it doesn't give you the emotional reward that you wanted, you kind of think, well, what's the point, you know? Um, I didn't, I started to become quite introvert. I'm such an extrovert person. I'm such a confident, elaborate, outgoing, outspoken person. And all of a sudden, I didn't want to leave the house. Not only did I not want to leave the house, I was noticed that I wasn't even letting light into my home. I was drawing the curtains. I didn't want to let light into my home, let alone let light into my life. And I'm sat drinking. I don't, I haven't, just for the camera to know, I haven't drunk alcohol for two years now. Um, I'm not a very good drunk <laughs> in general. But um, I'm drinking in the AM. Like I'm cracking about the wine at 11 o'clock in the morning. Yeah. I'm playing poker tournaments till eight, nine, 10 o'clock in the morning. I'm not sleeping right, I'm not eating right. I just, I've lost purpose. My life was no, I was now becoming a creature of circumstance. My world was happening to me. I wasn't happening to my world anymore. And at 23 years of age, it's not the right age to retire. Regardless of money, you have so much to give the world. Um, but mistakes are not mistakes if we learn from them. And I think for that reason, people say to me, when do you intend to retire? And I say, never. I'll work till the day I die. And by work, I mean add value to people's lives, contribute to the communities in which I live till the day I've got, I'm six feet under. And yeah. I, I find that an interesting thing. Like, um, you know, you talk about people trying to, you know, I can't wait till I retire. And I'll, one, of the, one of the funny things I think people mention is like, oh, do you see they've raised the retirement age? I'm like, you can do it whenever you want. For like, sure. not saying, you, not saying sure. everyone can just no. like, stop. No. But if you're not being that, that creature of circumstance, if you're going out there to, to try and make the world happen, yeah. um, you can choose that. For sure. You know, For um, sure. I realise that probably not everyone's going going to do that, but I think that maybe having that mindset Definitely. is probably not the right way to if, do it. I call it a state-based mindset. Like, if you're expectation is that by the time you stop working you're going to rely on the government of the country in which you live to provide your lifestyle then you failed to start with it doesn't matter whether you get to do it at 60 or 75 you failed you know so for me I think in hindsight the biggest lesson out of it is that in the year 2010 I set 10 life goals okay I'd never really done goal setting before I, I thought it was a bit airy fairy I, I never really connected with it and I always thought that it was quite philosophical not practical right Write down 10 dreams, build pictures around them, they'll come true, you know? The law of attraction says what you focus on, you attract. I thought, get me started on that I, thought God, yeah, I thought, God, this is a load of old shit, until I did it, and then it worked. I wrote down 10 things in life that I was going to achieve. They were quite big. Brian Tracy said to me, make them so big, they excite and scare you at the same yeah. time. I thought, okay. And these were things I'd never dreamt, like I, I didn't think I could ever buy a house. No one in my family's ever owned a house. I didn't think I could buy my mother a house. I didn't think I could start, grow and sell a business. I didn't think I could ever have straight teeth. I had to wear braces for three years to get it. <laughs> yeah. You know, own a Rolex, buy a BMW, go to Las Vegas, go to all six continents. You know, I didn't think, I, kind of, I wrote them down because it was what I was being told to do, not because I really believed it to be possible. You know? But in that, when I sold the business in February 2014, on that day I'd achieved nine out of my 10 life goals. I had one thing left which was to start a family. At 23 I wasn't ready. Uh, even now, 27, I'm just ready to start a family, you know? I'm just ready and in a headspace and in a financial position and in a position where I control my time, where I can actually now support another human being, you know? That's totally dependent on me. So. The lesson I had learned is instead of having 10 life goals, finishing nine of them, having one thing left to achieve, and that thing not being what you want right now, what I've done instead is I now have 10 life goals, but every time I tick one, I add one. Uh, okay. Every time I tick one, I add one. Yeah. So I've always got 10 things that I've got to do. And for me, to set goals, I always follow that acronym SMART, specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and time bound. So my 10 life goals are one for each year of the next 10 years. But when I achieve one for 2008, I just put one on the bottom. Everything slides up. Tick it, put one on the bottom. Everything slides up. Um, 
So now, no matter where I am in my life, I've got the next 10 years. And I don't focus too much further in front of that because I think if I'd have set my goals 10 years ago, I'd have never known that I wanted a Tesla, yeah. you know? So the world's changing so quickly, I think it's almost impossible to set goals too much further in front. I mean, I have no issues with dragging that right back to being five or six years. But um, anything too far in front of that, I think you're setting goals in a world that you don't know what it's gonna look like. Did I know that I could have used Amazon to drop ship products all over the world? No, well that would have never been a business goal of mine then, do you know what I mean? So that's why I think too much forward forecasting is not always appropriate. And I think that's interesting, like when you talk about uh, actually writing down your goals and you're ticking them off and even adding the one in. I've, I've never heard that one. I think that's I think that's a great way to, to keep things you for know, sure. potentially uh, for ongoing. Sure. Yep. Um, there is definitely like a distinct difference between like, it's gonna happen, it's gonna happen, it's gonna happen, it's gonna happen, to actually like, okay, that's the goal. These are the things I kind of, I need to do for roughly sure. at least to, for sure. to, to get for sure. there and then taking some sort of action. Like, for sure. Got to be a massive difference there between just basically wishing it of course. to happen and then actually taking those steps. A hundred and ten percent. Like we removed some words from our dialogue. So for me, I was quite fortunate that I spent two years mastering the process of neuro-linguistic programming and removing words like could, would, should, might, maybe, possibly, potentially, perhaps, it would be nice if I would like or I want, just eliminating them from my dialogue. Just can, will, do, shall, have, must, am. And by changing procrastination language into absolute language, my life stopped becoming a I stopped becoming a procrastinator and I started to become absolutely who I am, you know, so um, there is a big difference between saying I want to have a Ferrari by the time I'm 40. How? Cool. <laughs> great, great goal. Yeah. What do I do today? Now if you tell me you want to have a million dollars in the next 20 years, I say great, that means you need to save 50000 a year, which means you need to save $978 this week. Okay, cool. Well, I know what I've got to do this week. For me to make save 978 this week, I need to earn 2,000. To earn 2,000, I need to sell 5,000 for my company, which means I need to do 1,000 a day, which is one sale. So what do I need to do today? I need to make one sale. I need to make one sale today, and I'm going to have a million dollars in 20 years' time. And so you break that down to you know a daily, hourly task, whatever, whatever it has to be. You maximum re- you of daily. That. Maximum of daily. You can't control the old saying, yesterday's history, tomorrow's a mystery. The here and now. Some people are great talkers, but they don't do anything, right? Like, you've got to get off your ass and take the action. Our mantra here at ISR is that knowledge is not power. It's not. Knowledge is potential power. Knowing something doesn't mean that you've actually been rewarded by that knowledge. It's only the action that carries power, you know? And I meet people day in and day out that know every single element of our sales training program, but they're not selling. So knowledge is not the power. And the difference is put, actually putting that into action and Practical application. Practical application, that's the difference. For me, I believe I would be a fantastic football manager, because I know a lot about football. I know what good football should be like. I know how you should play good football. It doesn't mean my feet conform to that. You know, because my knowledge is not the power. My ability to you get my feet to action my knowledge, that's where the power exists, you know? So for me, goal setting is great, but practical action planning is more important. Goals are great, but goals are temporary. Visions are permanent. Set a vision, set stepping stones towards that vision, break them down to what do I need to do today? And let today be the only thing you control. So, mate, uh, recently uh, I saw you on the TV um, you at, on Shark Tank. Mate, um, it was great to great to see you up there. I guess, first of all, from my point of view, having already known yourself and Ryan, knowing, knowing you guys um, and what you're setting out to achieve, it was, yeah, I got a bit of a buzz yeah, cool. watching it. It, Good. Was, it was super to see um, you know, some, so many wonderful ideas coming through on there, but to yep. see someone that I, that I know was, was great. For sure. And, mate, like what I was impressed with, and I think that um, what, what most people would be like, I don't watch a lot of that show, but I feel it felt like you were the shark. Oh, wow, okay. You know, that, awesome. Well, well, the shark tamer, I should yeah, like yeah. say. <laughs> you know, I, I guess a lot of these people sort of go in there and, and they get they get grilled a little bit. Yep. You know, that's what it's like. Because yep. a, a lot of people are going to come there with good ideas and it's going to be like, no, you know, can't do this, can't do that. But, yep. um you got three of the investors on board. We did. And uh, you did a, a magnificent job of negotiating, mate. So yeah, Thank just you. Wanna, I want you guys to walk everyone through that because it seemed like it seemed like you had a plan. Did you have, did you think it out? A hundred percent. There was a strategy yeah. for sure, yeah. for sure. So we, I guess, whilst maintaining to have fluidity in the way we were gonna communicate, um, 
a lot like when a, a sports team sets up for their opponent, you know, you go, okay, I know that they've got a fast player on this side or he's quite physical in the middle of the park and this is how we're going to negate those people. Um, we had a plan of who and how we were going to present our package and we definitely had a plan of which sharks we intended to take with us. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah. And so it was always, was it always a plan to try and get get those three people or at least two of the three? For sure, like for sure. So for us it was, um, it was all about quantity. Yeah. Um, we were always going to be willing to negotiate the deal, as I said mm. to a lot of people in the interviews I've been doing since the day. M the money itself was probably the least important part, right? I don't, in the least egotistical possible way, you know, like, we're comfortable financially, do you know what I mean? It was never really about money, so um, we wanted to pick as many brains. That's what we were selling. We were swapping equity for knowledge, equity for contacts. Um, so it was always the aim to take three. Um, the absolute perfect scenario for us was that the three people collaborated, the three we got, um, and ideally we would have took them for 20%. We didn't want to let go of more than 20% of the business. Our negotiation was going to be around giving them 8% each. Um, on the show, because they were so interested, I actually get offered 7.5% each to the three of them. I was going to let go of 22.5% in exchange, and we were going to bring on board the three heads. But one thing you'll know about the show is that they very rarely like to get involved if they don't get at least 10% of the business. There's just not enough fat in it for them. If they're going to collaborate together, they want that, that stake. For sure. And otherwise, it's like, why would I give anything my attention if I only own 7% of it, do you yeah. know? So um, our intention was to take three. We knew the three we wanted. We got the three we wanted. Yeah. Um, we got full valuation for our business. And um, I think there's a little tipping point in the, in the conversation where the power becomes mine. Yeah. Um, and it's the, the, unfortunately for the viewers of the show, the show is not exactly what happens in reality. I guess like any TV show, you know, they make a, a production that is enjoyable to the viewer. But the reality is that the way the offers were made was a little bit different. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so the, what you're negotiating on camera is a little bit different to what's being... Yeah, just in the way that it's panned out. Like, um, on the show, Andrew Banks gives me the first offer. Mm -hmm. In reality, he gives me the last offer. Right. Janine Alice gives me the offer where she wants 28% of the business. Yes, I remember, because she wanted to have the... A guaranteed return lot. in 14 months. Yes, yes, yeah, I remember yeah. that. But that's the first offer I receive. Okay. I actually receive that offer about 15 minutes in. Yeah. I don't even in there 15 minutes and I get that offer. And okay. although the episode is about nine minutes, I'm in there for just over two hours in total. Okay, right. Yeah, yep. yeah. so it's a little bit more intense. They made mine a real positive story. Mm. Um, it was a little bit more intense and a bit grueling. It wasn't yeah. quite as easy as they had made it out, you know, but a lot of people say, God, you negotiated well. And I'm like, but I'm a, I'm a negotiation coach. My job. I'm a sales coach. Yeah. You know, if you had somebody that came in and they said they're a chef and they didn't make good food, you'd be worried, you know? <laughs> so, um, yeah, we did negotiate well, but so we should. Yeah, definitely. So we should. And, um, like, when they're talking about the the story there, I mean, did they all, did they obviously know a bit about the the company beforehand? Like, do they do they know uh, to a degree what's going on before they? You there's get on the there's show? some prior knowledge there yeah. for sure. I mean, look, there's a really intensive application process. Like, we applied for Shark Tank in November of last year. Um, Shark Tank was actually recorded on March the 4th of this year and it didn't air until June the 5th. So for over three months, I already knew the result, you know, and that was really tough that you're under pretty strict non-disclosure agreements and you want to leverage it. You want to use the fact that you've yeah. got these amazing investors and these amazing influences on your business. And they were influenced, like they were involved from a two, three days of walking out, like they were there, they were giving tips, they were introducing us to people, you know, um, having a look at our revenue models, so on and so forth from almost as soon as we walked out. I mean, Andrew Banks booked me to do the um, American Express Small Business Summit that goes around six cities. He booked me for that within 24 hours of me walking out, yeah. you know, I'd already had that booking, so that was great, but um, they know they certainly know a little bit about your business before you arrive. I mean, I, I was quite fortunate in the fact that 
I already had met Steve and Glenn previously. I'd done some, done some work with them. So um, with Steve, it was a very strategic play. Um, I had some training with him because we were the Gold Coast Young Entrepreneurs of the Year. Um, we, all the winners of that through Business News Australia, got to have a masterclass with him at his office at River City Labs. So I made a really definite point of asking some quite specific questions so that I would stand out from the other 19 people that were in there. Um, I then spent the next day with him. He was the guest speaker at the Mayor's um, Innovation Breakfast. We were, last year and fortunately last night, we've won the Mayor's Innovation Award two years in a row. Oh, I did so, say that, yeah, yeah. on Instagram, yeah. So we, um, we were there again, and luckily, as he arrives, we're in the middle of talking to the Mayor. So he turns up, sees our face, we're talking to the Mayor, which has real good validation, and he said, didn't I? meet you guys yesterday. I said, yeah, yeah, I was in the master class yesterday, reintroduced myself. Once he'd done his speak, I made a real point of going again to him at the end and speaking again. So it was all about entering his psychology and starting to become relevant in his life. We added him on LinkedIn, started commenting on a couple of his posts and just really positioned ourselves in his thinking. And then when I've walked into Shark Tank within the first like 15 seconds, he says, g'day Jack. I said, hey Steve, how are you? He said, I'm really, really well, mate. He said, I'm surprised you're in here though. And I said, oh, what surprises you about it? And he said, oh, I just didn't think you'd need to use a platform like this. And straight away, within 20 seconds of being in there, everybody else is now really interested in who I am because Steve's almost just told them that I, I might be too good for this platform, if that makes sense. Yeah. So, um, Do you think that also that helps with, with um, I see on that show that they get they get fairly competitive. They do. You know, they, they're like, no, I don't want to work with you. Well, if I have to, I will, and it's too good to pass for up. For sure, So do for you sure. think that something like that, they're like, wait a minute, I don't want to miss out on this to you? Definitely. I think that it was quite clear. One thing that they didn't show on the show, but I had made clear is that I was a massive fanboy of Steve, and I, and I am, you know, and, in the end, when I walk out to speak to Ryan, he actually says to Glenn, he's like, mate, you either come in with me or you're gonna miss out on this one because I'm gonna take them all, I'm gonna take them for the lot. He tries to do that, I don't know if you recall, but he actually reduces his offer down to 18% for the, for the full amount because he wants to take it exclusively on his own. Whether it's 18 or 30 or whatever he wanted. He just wanted to do it on his own. Yeah. Um, and he was right, that if they weren't able to collaborate, we would have gone with Steve, right? Um, if not, we would have took Steve and Glenn in combination. If we could, we took Steve, Glenn and Andrew, which we managed to. So we kind of got our, our preferred outcome, but by being smart in how we inserted ourselves into his life and his knowledge was actually one of the main reasons that they came on board. So the very, um, the first offer I get is Janine, that almost directly off the back of that, the offer I get Steve. He says, mate, I'll give you the money. I said, no problem, I'll give you the money. But before he does it, he says to me, Last month you asked me two questions. He said these are what they were. And he repeated word for word my two questions I asked him. And I was like, wow. He's one of those freaks that's just got a memory similar to mine. And he said, if you can tell me what my two answers were, he said, I'll give you the money. And I'd have recited his answers to him word for word. He said, I certainly didn't say it that eloquently, but <laughs> you're right. He said, so I'll give you the money. Yeah. And that was where that one had sat, so. I think that yeah. um, tells a bit of a story in itself um, in to do sales, marketing, business in that sort of realm that you, you, you're trying to like, you're trying to build a story, you're trying to um, get rapport with people. For sure. whether it Whether it's for sales for your business, yep. whether it's a sale of your business or, or equity share or something for like sure. that. Um, you know, there might be people out there that, that have better offers that might have more to give, but if you've if you've taken that time to become relevant to them, you know, I think that puts you at a better platform, it doesn't does. it? And I think if I could give any advice to anybody looking to raise capital, I mean, I've never done this before. I've only ever sold my business, which I think is very different when you're just going, I've got a business, do you want to buy it from me? Do you know, and you're just handing it over or mergers and acquisitions. But when you're bringing on board investors, they're not actually investing in your business. It's the least important part is what you do. They're investing in you first. They're buying the person. Okay, now what does the, business, the, the person do inside the business or the entity thereafter? So very much selling ourselves and humility, humbleness, honesty, you know, vulnerability. A lot of people think that what an investor wants to see is cockiness and arrogance. They don't. They want to see humble, honest, hardworking, accountable people. And um, I knew that. 
and I utilize that to my benefit. What didn't happen, and I don't know if I'm letting the cat out of the bag here, I don't know if they'll, they'll watch this sort of thing, but I actually had some training with Steve's business partner, a guy called Stuart Glynn. Um, I'd gone along to a capital raising masterclass and he had taught me how to approach investors and what investors look for when they make decisions. This was about two months before I went into Shark Tank. And I just used everything he taught me against his business partner who then decided to invest in me. So, so it should work that way. <laughs> <laughs> that's it, that's it. <laughs> it I was literally works. following their advice. Oh, I remember yeah. that, yeah. 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 Even down to how you value a business on the multiplier. Like anybody who's been watching Shark Tank the last couple of weeks. Yeah, I was interested There's, in that to actually see like what is a good deal. Yeah, yeah. Like for me, you look at the guy, I don't know if you've watched it um, last week, um, but there was a gentleman on there that was basically doing Uber for car valenting. Um, and his business was great. He just valued his business at $2 million and he only ever had $120,000 in revenue, you know? We walked in with a business that had done over $2 million in revenue since inception and we were asked valuing the business at 625,000 bucks. So all we did is valued our business at one year's gross profit. Um, which is a little bit of an undervalue. We probably could have gone 1.5, we possibly could have even pushed two, but what we knew is that the offer was too good to refuse. Mm. So it was never gonna be about the money, it was now gonna be about the deal. So I walked in there 110% certain I was walking out with an investor at that price. And you have to go into that thinking that as well. If, sure. you're, not, if you're not thinking that already, it's chances sure. are you're not it won't happen. something to work out. It just won't happen. So that's an interesting point that you make about the money. Like, you know, I've never been through something like that myself. But, um, yeah, firstly, trying to, to value, value your business. But also, do you think that... Um, if those numbers were different, it, not, not, not particularly in your scenario, but do you think that um, it's more important to get those people on board in your business rather than be too worried about like, well, you should really be paying me, the, you know, because sure. it's a macro big decision. You're not just it looking is. for someone to buy a product off you. I'm not no. saying that that's a small decision either, no. but you're, you're, you're looking for someone to, like you said, invest in you, yep. and this is for the long term. 110%, like you, I talk about it and I call it smart money and dumb money, right? So you'll hear the sharks use this term sometimes. They go, I'm just dumb money. And what that means is I can give you the money, I can take your business, but I don't think I can contribute anything. I don't know anything in this space. So for me, it was about making sure I walked away with smart money. And I think smart money has a multiplier of its own. Like a smart dollar is probably worth $5. A dumb dollar is worth a dollar, yeah. if that makes sense. So um, yeah, absolutely making sure that I was walking out of there with the actual numerical amount being the least important thing. So for anybody that's watching this who is in small business, I'd say if you're in that first three to five years, generally a, place, a good place to start is to focus on a multiplier of either one times gross revenue or two times gross profit. That will usually be a, a, a place to start. There's a few other variables like how residual or passive the income is, whether it's a subscriptive or a transactional model, things of that nature. But on the whole, if you want to just put yourself in the right stratosphere to start with, one times gross revenue or two times gross profit for a startup business that wants to scale it is probably the right place to approach an investor. There you've got it. Yep. And another thing I'm interested in too is like you, you had, was it two years that ISR had been around before? This two or three years? No, no, so we, no. we yeah, well, we launched in the March of 2015. 15. Um, so at the point I walked in there, I was three weeks short of my third birthday. Okay, yeah. cool. Yeah. So that wasn't from inception either. So that wasn't just like, I've got this idea, can someone give me some money? For sure. To like do we, it? we had $2 million worth of runs on the board. Yeah. You know, we had a proven model that had won awards, that had obtained some national media attention, that had proven to put you know, to assist, we had three and a half thousand clients at the time, and yeah, we weren't an idea, we were a functional operational business that was executing a growth plan that was gonna happen with or without them. Uh, uh, like, with or without the Sharks, ISR was still gonna be the number one sales training organization in Australia, fact. The difference is what would have taken me 10 years will now only take me two. Exactly. That's the difference. And is that um, is that where you see probably some of the biggest value from those Shark Tank investors? Like just being able to like, well, look, I, I reckon I can do this, but I really need you to like make things really efficient for, for me. For and sure. Push it Three biggest things that came out of it for me were access of contacts. They don't send you a mum and dad business to talk to. They send you Fairfax Media. They send you real insurance. They send you the flight centre, you know, um, the red, big red group with... Um, with Naomi and it's like, and they're not sending you people asking, you know, should we do this? They're just sending you deals, deal after deal after deal, hits my desk because of the people they're introducing us to, you know? That's powerful. Number two for me was accountability. 
since 14 years of age, I've had probably less than one year of my life where I've worked for somebody. Um, I'm 27 now, you know, in the last 13 years I've probably worked one year for somebody. Um, and what was that doing, if you don't mind me asking? Well, I, I got kicked out of school at 14. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, me and school were never, we never found a great relationship with one. I felt like lessons got in the way of me having fun with my friends, basically. And um, I loved sports, I loved anything that was practical, cooking, I liked if we were doing stuff in the science lab where we were dissecting or playing with Bunsen burners or anything that was practical, but I'm not a very good at the sit and listen. Yeah. Sit down, shut up. This is a Greek god, or this is the Crimean War, or this was, you know, the Second World War, whatever. Ugh, nah, I'm not interested. So I got asked to leave at 14. Um, Grew up in an environment where we knew how to, you know, my, my father was a semi-professional boxer, I come from, both my parents are Irish, like it's, you, you taught how to defend yourself and look after yourself, you know, and because I was a bigger kid, I got a bit of fun poked at me, and the way I knew how to deal with that is if you want to poke fun at me, I'll punch you in the mouth, we'll see how funny it is then, right? And because of that, me and school did never quite saw eye to eye. So I started my first business. I was wholesaling confectionery from the United States at 14. That's where I started my first business, and from there, yeah, only one year of the last 13 did I have a, a job. So what the sharks have brought me is accountability. I think it's the second thing, it's accountability. Like I now have somebody's expectations to meet instead of just my own. So it's not the same as a job as in like you're just gonna turn up and get paid and go home at the end of the day, but you're, re you're reporting to someone for and sure. you not just have to be there from eight to five, like you need to for make sure. results happen. For sure, like it's easy to get complacent when you're financially stable, you know, you, you look at, again, I, I'm, I'm sorry to any of the audience that's watching this because no, I'm not an egotistical person. I'm super, super humble and I come from nothing. But the difference in having $300,000 in your bank and $700,000 in your bank doesn't do a lot for your psychology. You feel equally as comfortable, yeah. right? So there's a certain point where money no longer gives you the motivation that you would desire. And you might get to a Friday afternoon and you're a little bit short of your company's target for the week, but hey, uh, who cares? It's in the bank, like whatever. Life goes on, do you know <laughs> what I mean? Whereas when you've got investors and you've set a schedule with them of performance, well, now I have got somebody's expectations to meet. Now it's not just about how comfortable I feel, it's about what's their return on investment. And for me, that's given me a whole new purpose. It's given me a whole new lease of life. I'm getting here earlier, I'm staying later, I'm having the tough conversations, I'm rebuttaling people two or three times to get the deal where I may have otherwise let them go. Um, I think that would probably be the second thing. So access to their contacts, the accountability, and also the third part of it is they've made it so simple again. Smart business people do not complicate things. Less is more. You know, like stop trying to be the best at everything. Just have a brand, have a name, and let people know there's one thing you do. And is there, so in saying that, are there things that you, you've dropped or that you've you know, you've restructured? Yep, we, are, we no longer do recruitment. Okay, right. We are ISR training and recruitment, but we no longer do recruitment. Yep. Um, it took up 80% of our time, but only represented 20% of our income. Yep. Pareto principle said it's no longer efficient, drop it. No point. Drop it. On top of that, it created the least satisfaction for my team. Um, human beings are not an easy product. No, no, no. Um, especially the entitled generation in which we live. I, I don't think we've probably had more of an entitlement attitude than the, the current millennials. They want to work as little as possible, get paid as much as possible, and think the world owes them something. The world doesn't owe you shit, period. No. You know, like, go out there and make things happen. So, um, I love people, but I didn't always love the 18 to 24 year old unemployed market here on the Golden Tweed Coast. They weren't, they, they, <laughs> Pretty hard, hard market to deal with. Yeah, they weren't, the mo they, you know, they weren't the most motivated group, they weren't the most accountable group, um, and they wanted something for nothing. So it's, it's exhausting us, it's sapping my energy, it's taking 80% of my time, providing 20% of my income. And even as I'm explaining it to the sharks, I'm going, why do I do this? And then they said to me, so why do you do it? And I went, I don't know. They said, so are you gonna keep doing it? I said, no, like, that's a great decision. Perfect. Great decision. What, what do you love? I said, I love coaching people how to sell and negotiate. I said, what are you good at? I said, teaching people how to sell and negotiate. What do you get paid the most to do? Okay. And the great thing you'll learn about a good coach is they never tell you what to do. They only ever ask you a question. And cool. they want you to get there yourself. Guided discovery. Because when you discover something for yourself, you own it. 
right? As human beings, we are nonconformists. We hate being told what to do. When it says wet paint don't touch, I'll just check it. You're, de you're desperate to check it. You're desperate to see if it's still wet, yeah. you know? So they don't tell me what to do. They ask me a question to, for me to discover what I should do. And when they see that I've had the light bulb moment, they ask me to now create some tangibility and practical application around it. So um, what I love is that they've, they're allowing me to create and develop my own ideas, not just giving me their ideas. That's what I like. Perfect. Yeah. So we were just touching base before about millennials and you know we're both of millennial age we are, so we, are. we fit that we fit that description um i'm a staunch sort of advocate supporter of the fact that there's lots of people our age out there that are bucking that trend that you know people want to label us with i suppose but yep. at the same time I, i'm not um you know, I'm privy to the fact that there's people out there that are pushing that trend and, and making that trend for sure, you know, seem, for sure. seem like that's how it is for yeah, everyone. Yeah. Um, I know that for a fact that we've had things really good in Australia. I know that here you can perhaps even perform slightly below average at your job and still maintain quite a good standard of living. For which, sure. Which is, you know, double-edged sword. It's good because you can get it easily and people yep. can live, but it's, it's bad because of, you know, perhaps some complacency. For sure. I mean, if you look at Australia and at the moment, if you were to work in a casual employment, the clerk award level one minimum wage is $23.88 an hour, right? Outside of the G20 countries, Australia's minimum wage puts you in the top 1% of income earners in the world. So your worst case scenario as an Australian is to be better than 99% of people in the world. So there is definitely a middle class attitude in this country for sure and I'm not I don't try to play on my past too much but I grew up in an area that was very deprived you know quite run down um, the most successful people I knew would probably earn about 400 bucks a week 500 bucks a week after tax the most successful the most successful people I knew um, in Australia you know the the person delivering your newspapers earns bloody more than that. Do you know what I mean? So I look at my staff and my wage bill here, you know, we've got a half a million dollar a year wage bill, and I look at what I'm paying people, and it makes me think, wow, if only the people in the UK knew what you got for administration work or whatever it may be, you know, basic tasks, um, they'd be here in a heartbeat, you know? But contrary to that then, there was also the cost of living. Yeah. So it's all well and good having a, f a massive income, but then, also, if people came over to Australia and you tried to charge them $5 or £3 for a Gatorade, they'd probably fall over, you know? So everything, I think, is relative in that circumstance as well. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think it's interesting because, um, you know, I've got a lot of friends from, from different backgrounds and I think that, you know, people from, from overseas, like, they see it like that. Maybe maybe people that have grown up in Australia, yep. maybe they see it, maybe they take it for granted, maybe yeah. they don't. But, you know, does, does coming from the UK and coming from that environment, does that keep keep you grounded and, and, and knowing that, like, I'm not saying the UK is rubbish, but what no, I'm saying no. is, like, it's a different environment. Yep. Do, you, do you sort of... You, do you sort of never lose lose sight of you know sort of what was again? Look, I'm here. I need to be keeping. Uh, I think so. Most of it. I think so. I think you've got to keep your feet on the ground. I, I always talk about feet on the ground, head in the clouds. You know, so stay grounded, stay humble. Don't forget what you, where you're from. And this was a big change for me in having just a vision board. I've always, since the, day, the year 2010, when I set my first 10 life goals, I've always had a vision board, right? So I have pictures, I have them in my office, I have them in my home, I have them on my laptop, I have them on my phone, so that everywhere I go, I can continue to harness my focus on where my life is going to be in the future. But I think sometimes we fixate so much on what the future looks like that we're actually forgetting to appreciate the present. So I've now got a gratitude board as well. So every single morning I wake up and I spend one minute giving thanks for the things I already have in my life and I'm not talking about things that money can buy again like you know my houses or you know I'm talking about love my sense of humor my relationships my health my fitness those are things that could never be money couldn't buy them back you know so um, definitely staying grounded but where I think Australia is very much a, a middle-class society quite a socialist country where the government aims to support its people the UK, unfortunately, is quite a capitalist society. So you either are in the 1% or you're not, it's you know? Huge, it's huge. Like, you've got multi, 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 multi millionaires, and yet you've got, at the moment, the highest rate of homelessness since the year 1929. Um, you've got the fewest amount of social housing for the unemployed single mothers that we've had since the Second World War, you know? So the country is in a very dire position, especially because of, and this is not a racist comment, I'm an immigrant. 
immigrant. I'm an immigrant of this country. But when you create an immigration policy that allows an overwhelming amount of people to join your country who are not always contributing to that country, you put yourself in a very fragile state. So for me, millennials in Australia fall into one of three categories. They're either silver spooned, and the silver spooned ones tend to go and get a tertiary level education, they get a hundred grand a year job, and they're waiting for their access to the trust fund, yep. right? The second type of person is what I call your average Joe. They don't have massive aspirations, they love getting out in the surf in the morning, or they love having their beers on a Friday, they earn their thousand bucks, fifteen hundred bucks per week, they spend it as quick as they earn it, and usually, to be honest, they're some of the most content people. The third type of uh, the entrepreneurs, you know, you have still got an underbelly of innovators and creative thinkers, but I think they actually have a part A and a part B. You've got entrepreneurs and wantrepreneurs. Wantrepreneurs are people that just want the world to think they're doing something great. They're su style over substance. They don't actually give a shit if they're being successful as long as people on their Instagram believe they are, right? And then you've got entrepreneurs. Real, genuine entrepreneurs care not what people think of them. Real entrepreneurs actually don't care about money. They care about, care about changing the world. They care about leaving a legacy and an impact on the communities or the service sectors in which they operate. And that's what gets them out of bed in the morning. You know, For me, I'm here to change the perception of sales. I wanna create a legacy that says swish and the swish accreditation means that you can sell ethically and you can sell with integrity. The natural byproduct of that is I'm gonna make a shitload of money but the money isn't the important part, do you know what I mean? If you, anybody who's watching this and is considering setting up your own business, if the purpose of starting your business is to make money, then you will fail. If it's a finance-centric business that tries to develop customers, it will fail almost every single time and almost instantaneously. But if you build a customer-centric business and the natural byproduct of that is that you make money, you'll stand the test of time. I promise you. Yeah, and and because you're going in it for the right reasons, and I, sure. I think it can be even sort of filtered down to, to things like um, whatever it is. It can be a sport, it can be a business, whatever. If you're going into something that you don't like, yep. you won't withstand those shitty moments. No way. And I can, you know, I'm sure that you've had your, your ups and downs in your business. In fact, tell tell me about a, a time where things were just not going great and you, you found a way out of, of your business. The whole recruitment model. So I, I, I designed a recruitment model that was totally free of charge for businesses, right? So instead of the businesses paying for our services, the actual job seeker would pay for our training. We would offer them pre-employment and post-employment training. What we realized was that we actually then got communication from the Private Employment Agents Act um, and from the Office of Fair Trading. Our business model was totally illegal. You were not allowed in this country to charge job seekers for the act of attempting to find them work. Yeah. We were basically shut down overnight. We couldn't operate anymore. We could, but we'd be breaking the law, and we were very much in the focus of the government body that was regulating our industry. So that was like someone popping your tires. Yeah, that'd be a tough one to wriggle out of. I still knew I had a V8 engine. <laughs> I just didn't have any air in my tire. I couldn't go anywhere. Um, so going back to the drawboard, I call it scrambling. You know, it was just scramble readjust, conform to the requirements of the industry, advise your strategic partners of the changes, and then almost reinvent yourself, you know? That was really tough. Like, yeah. and if you didn't love it, you just wouldn't have got through it. Yeah. And I mean, even go back to the start of business, like when you're in startup business, for eight months, for 32 weeks, myself and Ryan worked 70, 80 hours a week. We didn't get paid once, not one dollar. If you don't, I love it, and I'm talking about in here, you're not seeing a vision of how you're gonna change the world, you just won't do it. You just won't do it. You'll never get out of bed at five o'clock in the morning, go to bed at nine o'clock at night. I had periods where, like my, my record for this, this business is that I worked 84 days straight, without a day off. You know, you combine those as being 13, 14 hour days, people go, you must be knackered. I go, no, I'm more energetic than ever. I'm fueled by it, I love it. And if you love it, you'll live it. I think that's an interesting thing too, like because I do quite a lot of things at once that are, are quite quite demanding on me, and uh, like I wouldn't really have it any other way. I yep. mean, yeah, there's there's times where sure I'd love a bit more time off, and I know that that'll happen down the track when I wanted to happen, yep. I suppose. Yep. But I think if you're going into that 
uh, with that mentality that it's just going to happen like that, then yeah, it's, it's that's it's that not. entitlement attitude. Just because you've you're a entrepreneur and you want to tell the world that you own your own business doesn't mean you're going to achieve riches. It's only good at backyard barbecues. Of course, oh, it is. He's doing this thing. That's it's like, it. Uh, but yeah, for, it's not really a business. For me, I just want to. St- I've always tried to steer clear of that. You know, whenever even with. <laughs> Shark Tank's been an interesting process because I'm getting stopped in the street, I'm getting stopped in the shopping centre, I'm getting stopped at the Titans Rabbitohs game. It was so funny that I'm in the lift. I booked a box at the Titans Rabbitohs game for me and some friends, and I'm in the lift, and Kevy Walters and Greg English are in the lift, and Kev Walters says to me, You were on Shark Tank. This is like four <laughs> days after. I've got the coach of the Queensland Origin team telling me he knows who I am. Yeah. And I'm sat in there, bolt upright, thinking, That's Kevy Walters. That's- that's you Greg, didn't go, that's you Greg got English. Some tickets to the game? Yeah, I, I just <laughs> stared at my own feet, right? And I was just thinking, oh, because I get so starstruck, right? Because yeah. I'm still just such a normal kid, and I see people, I'm like, whoa, Greg English, like, this is crazy. Because <laughs> he wasn't playing, because they'd had Origin on the Wednesday. Yep. If you, I don't know if you recall, my birthday was Tuesday the 5th, Shark Tank aired on Tuesday the 5th, but game or, one of Origin was Wednesday the 6th. Mm. This was the Friday night at, at the time. I remember listening to it on the radio. Yeah, at the Titans. and. That was a bit weird, right? And it's at that point where you start to understand there's two parts of that for me. One is, I refer to this moment right now a lot like being a surfer. I sit and watch the surfers. I go to Burley Hill all the time. I find it so therapeutic and I sit up there and I have myself a coffee and I watch these surfers. And I've never understood why they choose the wave they do. I sit three or four times and I watch them not catch a wave and I think, what was wrong with that one? Mm, Just get that one. What was wrong with that one? What was wrong with that one? And then eventually, they decide to paddle and get up. And I guess that's a lot like business. That's a lot like life. You're waiting for the right wave. Certain waves come, but if you decide to catch a wave too early, you may actually miss the cracker that was about to come on the neck, the third or fourth one in the set, right? So the world can't tell you what's the right wave. That's your choice. And I think what's so unique about life and business is that that, that's, that specific wave will never come again. Every single wave that ever breaks is a once and a once only opportunity. You'll never get that chance again. But when you're up on the wave, which is what I am right now, I'm up, I'm on my board and I'm on a wave and this wave is taking me on this journey where I'm getting a lot of exposure. But you need to remember that, that, that eventually that barrel will break. And now when you're back outside the break again and nobody knows who you are because you're not relevant, it's not news anymore, is that's why the feet have to stay on the ground because there'll be a time where I'm just sitting waiting again and I'm waiting for the next wave, you know? So that's what's keeping me grounded and keeping me humble. I think that's that's super awesome advice to to give to people and a good, um, you know, work ethic and, and, sure. and everything to have for around sure. that. One of, the, one of the things that uh, a mentor of mine told me once was that it's, you know, remember the people on the way up because they'll remember when you're on the for way sure, down. For sure, for sure. You know, and, and I think that that's, that's a hard thing because um, it is probably easy to get swept up in when mm-hmm. things are really happening. It's mm-hmm. like, fuck it. Yeah. Like, um, you know, but yeah, yeah, look, celebrate, be be happy and be merry, but Definitely. just remember that, like, it wasn't so long ago for that sure. things for sure. weren't so good. And talk less and do more. Like, so many people in the first six months of business want to tell the world what they're doing. Mm-hmm. What you're seeking is either validation, acceptance, or permission. You're either looking for permission to keep going, you're looking for validation that you're good at what you do, or you're just simply seeking acceptance. You want people to accept you for the skills that you may possess. But people talk so much in the first six months. When you, the more you talk it up, the more you are putting yourself on a pedestal and people are itching to see you fall. They are itching to see you fail. Albert Einstein said everything is energy, and that's all there is to it match the frequency of the reality you want and you cannot help but get that reality. It can be no other way. But what you need to understand about inflected energy is that if 100 people around you are pointing negativity in your direction and they're desperate to see you fail, the law of attraction says that that becomes more of a probability, right? So the best way to get people on side and keep people on side is to talk less and do more. Let your business talk for you. Don't talk for your business, right? And then when people go, God, I've noticed your business about a little bit you guys seem to be doing well and you go thank you so much for your kind words i really appreciate it we're nowhere near where we want to be but we're out there giving it a go it's interesting that you say that too because i um i met with a real estate agent recently and did some stuff at an open home and um i I knew him from from the area like he'd he'd, uh, like come up on my feet and i just i liked the way he was going about his social media and stuff like that and yeah I, i really sort of bought into the story and i just mentioned that to him and he goes yeah it's funny because like 
now that I'm really putting this out there, people are going the same thing. Oh, geez, like you're killing. Well, I am, but like I've been sort of doing about the same for a while, but now I'm just like displaying. I'm outwardly so projecting. I think it. that's a cool thing, and it's 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 easy to get caught up in for sure. in how you go about, especially the social media strategy. Like I I love in what I do anyway. I tell the story. Yes. Like like hearing for sure. from people for like sure. you. And, for sure. And it's cool to hear the story, but. Um, everyone can tell, I think, when you're projecting something that's not you anyway, yeah. that's not a it's business or whatever it not is. A, yeah, and it's just, it, I don't know about you guys, but with me, when I see somebody going, look at my car, look at my house, look at my business, all I think is arrogance. All I see is arrogance. It doesn't make me, it doesn't inspire me, um, it doesn't motivate me. All it says, all I keep saying is I don't want to be like that. And a lot of people find it quite weird that I don't have social media, right? So I have a... I went to tag you on Instagram for this, and I think it was a thing with one follower. Went, yeah. Oh, I can't, I can't <laughs> so I have an Instagram. I posted one photo on January 27th, 2015. It said, IS Recruitment, um, we're not coming to take part, we're coming to take over. Watch this space. Yeah. That's the only photo I've ever put on That's Instagram. That's a very Irish thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it was the only only photo, photo I've ever posted on Instagram. I mean, Facebook, I don't accept people I don't know. Um, so I'm very particular with who I allow to have access to my Facebook. It's I don't use it. I'll mm. post maximum of once a week. More like a couple of times a month. Mm. Um, it's more so that my friends and family, I can keep a little eye on some of my nephews and my nieces and things like that um, is what I use it for. But. Um, I've never been seeking the media attention. This has never been my, like you guys pointing all these cameras up here, it's, it's great, it's, it, it has an emotional reward, but it's never been my purpose. Ryan is probably more like that. Ryan has been seeking putting himself in the limelight and becoming a social figure for a long time. And I think that's why the yin and yang work quite well because he likes that and I don't. So therefore, my strengths are often his weaknesses and, and vice versa. So I love the fact that he's put his hand up and said, hey, I'll be the face, I'll yeah. be the name, I'll be the voice. Um, and then I can just be the engine behind that name, that face, that voice. So I'm quite a private, I'm, I'm quite a private person um, yeah. in general. And it's a real challenge at the moment when Smart Company, The Entrepreneur Magazine, Gold Coast Bullet and The Courier Mail, you know, Gold FM. So everyone wants to talk to you and it's like, now the whole world's gonna know who I am. <laughs> I always pictured myself being the billionaire ninja, you know? And you just, that, that silent guy that just no one knows, but yeah. And I'm the most unassuming bloke, you know? Like, you'd, you'd see me outside of a business um, time and you wouldn't check me twice. You wouldn't think I was successful, you wouldn't think I made money, I've got a pair of high tops on, I've got a baseball cap on, you know, I've got a basketball vest on. And You're fitting riding on the, on the Gold Coast. That's right? it, I'm, ta I'm tatted up all yeah. over my body and I don't drive a fancy car or anything like that. I'm just, I'm, I don't have a personalised plate. I'm just yeah. quite an unassuming character and I, I want to keep it that way. That's, that's good and I think yeah. that what's, what's interesting to me also is that, um, yeah, there is a lot of people out there just wanting that attention or um, a bit of fame or whatever sure. you want to call it for, for not sure. really doing a great job. No, no. Uh, but and, I, I look at the them, Lo it. Love Island, Big Brother, um, you know, these types of shows and the programmes and you think, how it what how did you just acquire celebrity status? Because yeah. you haven't earned it, in my opinion. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. They usually just end up on um, Hit 105 or something like that. Eventually, <laughs> yeah. 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 But, uh, no, I think that that's, that's interesting too. Also, the fact that um, you have Ryan who, you know, obviously Ryan's a super down-to-earth person too, but he's still happy to sort of be that, For sure. be that face. For sure. How, how, can you give some other examples about how, why you and Ryan are, are, a, are a really good match? Yeah, for sure. I guess um, I believe a good, I'm the kind of, the, although the titles work in a certain way, for me, I'm the CEO. I'm the ideas man, right? My, my job is to look up and out and create. Ryan is an engineer, he's a technical guy, he's a process guy, so his job is to look down and in. So his is about efficiencies, his is about systems, processes, functionalities, mine's about, let's try something elaborate, let's... And Ryan, how would we make this happen? Correct, so I'll go, here's an idea, he'll go, okay, that's how we can actualize it. Um, Ryan, we play good cop, bad cop, um, you know, I'm, I'm just, I just see the best in everybody and I'm such a super laid back character. Um, I absolutely hate the, the, what I call the ugly side of management, when I have to discipline people, when I have to put performance warnings on people. Ryan loves that. Yeah. Loves it. 
lives and breathes it, right? So that's another side of our management that works really, really well. Our sales styles are different. Ryan's highly consultative. He plays, he does what I call anti-sell, reverse selling, pull selling. So he never tries to sell you anything. All he does is gives you value, gives you value, gives you value and waits for you to ask to buy something from him. I'm the other way around. I'm highly authoritative, highly assumptive. Um, you've bought it from me before you even know what it is um, in the way I sell. So our sales styles are different, our management styles are different, um, our cognitive abilities are different. Um, Ryan's an overthinker, an overprocessor. Um, if I was any more laid back, I'd be horizontal. Um, you know, I just take everything in my stride. Ryan likes to practice three times what he's going to do tomorrow. I don't even want to know what I'm doing tomorrow until it is tomorrow. Um, so I'd say there are lots of reasons why we're the yin to the yang works really, really well. Perfect, perfect partnership. Really. It, it is. It, it literally is a perfect little storm. And um, he's highly logical. I'm highly emotional. Um, there's lots of almost polar opposites, but like two ends of a magnet, that makes us great friends, great companions, and, and great partners. Yeah. 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 And I mean, I can even tell that we were talking, we were discussing before about how when I did Ryan's interview, like, I did the pretty much the same thing, sent yeah. through a few questions yeah. with, with notice, and Ryan came in with like all these sort of notes and whatever. I'm like, oh yeah, cool. But you're just like, yeah, look, I scanned over it, but like, let's just let's just. Yeah. Like, oh, I just I just love all. I'm passionate about organic conversations and about organic relationships. Um, very comfortable in my own skin, very confident in my own ability, my knowledge um, and my communication skills. So um, you'll find that the worst version of me is a prepared me. If you go and watch some of our um, training videos, because I've got a specific subject and I'm talking at a camera, not to a human being, I feel like I'm quite robotic um, in some videos and I've been working on being more natural. The way we've aided that is putting a person behind the camera. So I've still, I'm looking at the lens, but I'm looking just above it at the human being behind it and I'm talking to that human. And that thing makes things a lot easier for me. So um, Ryan lives by the six Ps. He says proper preparation prevents piss poor performance. And I get that. Um, Oh, for me, life is more fun when you take every challenge as it comes, yeah. you know? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, I find that's a good way to approach a lot of things. And I, I find that, um, yeah, there's certain scenarios I go in, I'm, I'm super, super prepared for things, but I also yeah. like the fact that, I also think that sometimes over-preparing, it makes you nervous. It does. And I've found in situations, whether it's these sorts of things or whatever it yeah. else, I have to go in. Yeah. Um, I just don't think about it. I just no. go, oh, I'm better off just going to have a chat with this person. Absolutely. Because if I overthink it, I'm like, oh, do I have to say this and do I have to say that? Like, and also, these, it, it, these, these questions are just like, ballpark, where do we start? Framework. We just, we yeah. Because I think if I came in with like six things I wanted to say to you today, I'd be constantly trying to find where I could bring them into the conversation. Whereas... You'd need about a hundred hours if you wanted to unpack me in my entirety. Do you know what I mean? Like you want to come on this journey and you want to dissect everything that I believe in and that I know. So for me, it's like I've got the arsenal. Mm. The reason Swish is such a powerful communication mechanism, period, although it says sell with integrity, sell honestly, I think you're always selling yourself. I'm not, I'm not in here today to transact with you, but I'm selling myself to you, right? I think that that's happening in when we're um, creating an impression on somebody at all assets of our life. And what I love about being honest and having integrity and transparency is I don't have to remember anything. I don't have to remember a single thing about today and about what you're gonna publish online about me because it's a continuous repetition of reality. So when I can just stick to the cold hard fact, I've only got to remember one thing. And it's easy to remember because I did it and I lived it. You know? Yeah. It makes yeah. it a lot easier for me. Yeah. We touched on a few yeah, look, we touched on a few things that you were you were talking about there about um, you know, how you go about life and how you go about your business. Um, I'm just wondering, is there any, and obviously with the, with the sharks as well, is there anything or, or one sort of piece of advice that, that has, has stood out over, over time, whether it be personal or business related? Mm, mm. Um, less is more. Less is more. The less you try to be and do, the less people have to know you for. Um, keep it stupidly simple, you know? Um, stick to the basics in most circumstances and stop seeking perfect. 
stop waiting for something to be perfect before you're gonna do it, right? And I see this all the time in even like my social relationships. I've got friends and it's like, this perfect storm has to happen on the right day at the right time in the right place with the right people or we just won't catch up. Mm. You can just pick up the phone, speak for five minutes on a drive to anywhere and catch up, do you know? So I live by the philosophy that if the first version of your business, and bear in mind, this is like ISR 7.9. If the first version of your business is the best one that you ever do, you've failed anyway. So stop trying to create awesome. Sometimes good is good enough to get started and let it grow and evolve as you grow and evolve, you know? So um, stop masking or hiding your insecurities. Start to own them. Start to accept them. Give life to them. Um, understand you'll, you'll never know what you don't know. Right? You'll never know what you don't know. So stop trying to wait for the answers to come. Work with the resources you already have at your disposal today. And implement the continuous cycle of improvement. And what that means is to plan, do, check, standardize. At all points in your life, analyze where you're at. Write a plan. Do the plan. Check if you're doing met your expectation from the plan. If it didn't, write a new one. If it did, standardize it. Make it a part of what you do forever, continuously and moving forward. So, But above any of that, just remember people buy into people. Be humble, be honest, be transparent, and be willing to be vulnerable. People are, wanna know less what you can do and more so what you actually can't. Because when you've accepted your own shortcomings, you've actually become the 360 holistic version of a true professional. My first customer paid for the production of my product. Yep. So I had a customer, I sold something I didn't have, I had the ability to create it, I just didn't have the money. So I sold the product to somebody and I asked them for 28 days to deliver it to them. I then built it in those 28 days, delivered it to them, and I now own the product to sell it to everybody else thereafter. And I bet you're able to be up front and say, look, I need, I need time to make this happen, but you know. At the moment, my average lead time is 28 days. Are you comfortable with that? Yep. Yes, great. Produce the product. Yeah. You know, so Let's get it done. there's no better way to find out whether the, the industry actually wants your product than to offer it to the industry before you have it. If you offer it to 50 people and all 50 of them say, no, I don't want it, well, the best thing to do is probably not create it. <laughs> you know, so um, I've dealt with businesses that have got warehouses full of stock they can't sell because they were the person that wanted to buy it, not the public. The public didn't want it. And they should have known that by doing some better research, you know. Survey Monkey is a powerful tool. Get it out there, ask the world, what do they want? How would they want it? What would they pay for it? What convenience measure would they want to be able to stay loyal to it? And once you understand what the market wants, deliver the market its request. And give the people what they want. That's it. And that's all it is. Like, I didn't always see this business being digital. I love people. So I love training people. And I love being a physical presence in people's offices. And although that still dictates about 50% of what we do, the market didn't want Jack in their office for three hours. They wanted Jack's content in their office 24 7, 365. Um, felt a bit disappointed. <laughs> felt a, felt a little, oh. yeah, yeah. Felt like, you know, I don't feel as wanted anymore, but it just wasn't how my information was going to be best utilized by a business. I had to accept it, I had to give the market what it wanted. Excellent. Yeah. Well, I'm always interested to know how many hours people work, what their days look like, things, you know, morning rituals to kickstart your day. I know cool. it's sort of roughly yeah, yeah, how cool, that man. looks for you, but yeah, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm keen to dive into that a little yeah, bit. Yeah, for sure. I think that's important because I think it's super interesting to me, at least, to see how people actually go about their day. Yep. You know, when you talk about funneling everything, like you want a million dollars in the bank or whatever, what do I got to do today? Yep. What does my day look like? How for does sure. It, how does it for happen? sure, man. My, every single one of my days for the last two or three years have happened exactly how I decided they were gonna go. Yep. Do you know what I mean? Very rarely do I have a variable in my day because I just don't see them. They might arise, but I just, I don't have capacity to view them. I've got the blinkers on yeah. and I've got a schedule of tasks for a day and nothing will interrupt me. I will not answer a phone call on my phone that was not, in a lot of circumstances, that was not pre-organized. Mm -hmm. You know, I'll let it go to voicemail, I'll leave your voicemail. Yeah. I'll probably get one of my team to call you back and organize to book in. If you're not booked in, yep. my days are back to back to back to back all day. I started this morning 6.30, my first, my first coaching session, and I just ran back to back. Went, I've turned up three minutes early to a company called Aqua Blue Distribution, did them from nine until 12.30, managed to get back four minutes late to Paradox to have a 1 p.m. meeting, and I rocked up here at about two minutes to two. Yeah. I'll leave here, I'll finish with you at five, I've got a five o'clock appointment, yeah. six o'clock appointment, seven o'clock appointment, I'll finish tonight at about 
somewhere between five two and five past eight. I'll be home at eight thirty. I'll eat my dinner. I'll get showered. I'll put a book in my hand. I'll read. I'll be asleep by nine thirty tomorrow. I already know what tomorrow holds. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Just every day is just totally. I wouldn't say regimented, but it's dictated and determined by me. I, I like that sort of term too because I try and I, you know obviously still working there's parameters around that but I still try and structure that I mean it was at least a month ago that I booked in this yep. wasn't it because yep. I knew that like I had all these things coming up okay yep. I've got to book this in and, and like for make sure it happen, for sure so. and I don't mean it from a negative way with like customer service because. Some people view that and go, well, hold on, is that customer service? Mm. If a customer calls you, you should answer their call. But that's why I have a team of people yeah. to be able to support me, you know, so that I can focus on the part of the business that I enjoy and that I am um, contribute, which is the actual training itself. And then that's why my team of people are here behind me to yeah. complete the communication necessary thereafter. And, and they're not, it's not, doesn't mean that someone's calling and they're not getting the response or the answer or the thing that they need. It just no. means that you no. know everything's efficient. For sure, and also you know we just put Hunt Group on my phone, so like if you call me and I don't answer within seven rings, it will divert to the landline. Yep. The, the, Michelle will answer or wh whoever it might divert to will answer. You're still getting communication from ISR as a company. You're yeah. just not gonna reach Jack without an appointment. Yep. You know what I mean? And that's why I actually find people who call me without permission to do so, I actually get offended by it. Okay. I would rather you text me yeah. Because if you text me, you create capacity for me to reply at my first available opportunity. Mm. When you ring me, you're almost demanding that I should be available to answer your call. Do you know what I mean? So I find that interesting because, yeah, that's kind of... I don't make many phone calls either myself. Okay. It's more like messenger me. Yeah. If, we're gonna, if I'm going to actually spend a lot of time with someone, I'd probably prefer to meet up for with sure. them. If, for sure. In this day and age, like you can do heaps over... A messenger chat or text or, sure. or whatever. Can do. And I think we're more we're, we're just more comfortable with that communication platform now, you know? Like for me, there's only really two times a day that I check my emails as well. Like I only really have the first half an hour and the last half hour. I think one of the biggest inhibitors to performance in the business environment is emails. People constantly sit there checking and answering emails and I call them firefighters. They just put out fires all day. Mm. They don't build fire breaks, you know? Yeah. Um, if you just commit 30 minutes in the morning, 30 minutes start of your day and your end of your day to respond to all of your emails, everybody's still gonna have never gone more than 24 hours without communication from you, yeah. but you haven't been distracted through the whole period of your day, constantly stealing your momentum from yeah. you. And constantly getting distracted by a task that wasn't inside, when you started your day, you said I was gonna do these seven things today. You didn't understand that there was a variable coming, but when that variable arises, put it on tomorrow's list. Mm. Make it a priority for tomorrow if necessary, do you know yeah. what I mean? Don't get me wrong, sometimes things arise and they need to be dealt with instantaneously, yeah. but um, yeah, very, very rarely. Yeah. People would um, probably respect your time a lot more too. For sure. And then that helps you and it helps them really. For sure. So talking, um, you asked me the question, why am I so comfortable with working 70, 80 days straight and working 12, 14, 16 hours a day? Two reasons, one, I'm purpose-led. Um, this is my passion. It's not my profession, this is my passion. And if you absolutely love sport and you had the opportunity to do it all day, you would. If you love singing, if you love swimming, if you love gym and you could do it all day, if you could surf all day, you would. Well, I have the opportunity to do this all day, so I will. But also I was raised, a single parent raised by a strong willed Irish woman that worked two jobs um, and worked between six and seven days a week our entire life. So I guess it was normal to me as well. Um, if you wanted to have things in life, you had to work for them. So um, that would probably be another part. The third and final part would be I slowed down. I stopped working for nine months and it nearly killed, like genuinely nearly killed me. I used to have such negative internal talk. Like I used to think about things that you shouldn't think about, you know? So um, I just, I'm never gonna slow down again, ever. Not until my body slows me down. Um, I've had that happen too. Um, the one thing I will say about exhaustion, mental and physical exhaustion, I have woken up before blind. I woke up in the morning with my eyes totally gray. I couldn't see anything. Um, and that was for about five or six minutes. Um, I've had moments where I've been in the shower in the morning, um, where I've only had three or four hours sleep and I've been vomiting on myself in the shower and things. So I guess metaphysically, you've got to listen to your body. Um, if you want an example of how to burn yourself out, take the Steve Jobs story, you know. Um, he was scheduled to be the richest man in the world. If the stock price at that time when Apple kept rising, he would have surpassed Bill Gates roughly about a year after he died. Obviously got pancreatic cancer, passed away in his early 50s, 53 I, I believe from the top of my head. So. 
Um, I think health is wealth. You've got to listen to your body. But at 27 years of age, I look after myself, I eat well, I drink right, I sleep right. And from 4.55 in the morning till 9.30 at night, I'm putting on, man. Yeah. I'm just going to put on. And, and so that's, that's where it starts and ends every day? At every that. single day. And why 4.55? Um, I used to be a lazy, lazy teenager. I was one of those sleep until midday type of kids, right? Yeah, I used to be like that. <laughs> <laughs> and then I, I when the cricket's on. That's it. And then I used to say to myself, well, okay, 6 a.m. Um, I want to wake up at 6 o'clock. I heard about this thing called the 6 a.m. club, and it was all about the most successful and elite performers in the world, you know, all the way back from the late 1800s, the Napoleon Hills and the Dale Carnegie's, and these people had all woke up at 6 o'clock in the morning. And I was like, well, Anthony Robbins taught me modeling was the number one way to achieve success. Find someone who's been successful and replicate their actions. So I was like, okay, 6 o'clock, I'm going to do it, 6 o'clock. And then I read a book by a guy called Robin Sharma called The Monk Who Sold His Ferrari. And I got a, really attached to her, this guy, this Canadian Indian guy called Robin Sharma. I thought his insights were amazing. And his club was called the 5 a.m. club. I think, well, if I can get up at six, I can get up at five. What's the difference? And then this year I got inducted into a Gold Coast-based community called the 4 a.m. Empire. And I was like, okay, well, if I can do five, I can do four. Um, I started getting up at four and I was finding that being awake at four o'clock was actually leaving my energy and my resources just a fraction short. So I thought to myself, okay, well, if I can, if I still put a four in front of it, if it's 4.55, <laughs> it's still it. at the time of four something. And it kind of just found a happy medium for me. So 4.55 until five o'clock is about remembering my dreams. I sit for five minutes and I try to stay in a, almost a subconscious state. Um, and I immediately try and remember my dreams. Um, so. Neurolinguistics say that you have three types of dialogue. You have a, an inbound dialogue, which is what you hear, an outbound dialogue, which is what you physically say, and an internal dialogue, which is what you say to yourself. You will spend on average four hours a day inside your internal dialogue. During that period, you'll ask yourself a question roughly every seven and a half seconds. So a human being asks themselves roughly 1,800 questions a day. But the moment when you ask yourself the most questions is usually when you put your head on your pillow. Because in the modern world, in the Western world, that's probably the first time in an entire day that you've been silent. What I mean by silent is that's not silence. No. Watching TV is not silence. Listening to a good podcast or watching a good video online, that's not silence. Reading is not silence. And when you put your head in your pillow and you can achieve silence, if you take the word silent and you rearrange it, it creates the word listen. It's the first time that you actually listen to yourself in a day. So you're not just talking to yourself, but you're actually listening to yourself. And the reason why some people struggle to sleep is because they have questions on a loop that they're unable to answer. The sub and the unconscious brain are highly powerful. When you actually go into a sub or an unconscious state, you often find the answer to the question you couldn't answer in your conscious state. So when you wake up in the morning, remembering your dreams for that first one, two, three, four, five minutes usually contains the answers to yesterday's questions. And that's why I always find that I can achieve so much in the first five minutes because the things I was unable to achieve yesterday, I've already achieved today. So some people say, oh, I, ju I just can't remember my dreams. And there's one reason you can't remember your dreams, and that's because you're telling yourself in your outbound dialogue that you can't remember your dreams. And it is literally as simple, back from Henry Ford in 1850 told you, if you think you can, you can. If you think you can't, you can't. Either way, you're right. So just change your psychology to say, I can remember my dreams, then actively do what it is you're trying to do and they'll arrive. So 4.55 to 5 o'clock, remember your dreams. It's that time of reflection. Yeah. And so after 4.55, what does the rest of the day look like to you? If my missus is not still in bed, uh, my partner is a nurse, she works in shift work. Um, if she's up with me, make the bed. Make the bed, start so there. That first small win of the day. Just is have that, a success, have thing? a tick, yep. yeah, have a tick, success. If she's in bed, I shine my shoes. Yep. Even if I shine them yesterday, I'll shine them again today. Yep. Um, let's win something. Um, I've been following an influencer called Jim Quick. Um, Jim Quick has a business called Quick Learning, and it's about um, memory retention and um, psychological capabilities. And what he talks about is the fact that the human being only uses 20% of their brain's potential. 19% of that comes from the dominant side of your brain, and only 1% comes from the non-dominant side of your brain. 
Um, the brain is water. So another thing I would do very early is get as much water on board. I don't know if you've been just whilst we've been having this, yep. this video. I'll, I'll probably get through about six, seven liters of water a day. I'll drink two liters in the first one hour of the day. The brain's 90% water. 10% dehydration can cause a 70% lacking concentration. I can't afford not to concentrate. I just don't have the ability to, to do that within my working day. So um, yeah, high water intake, but also understanding that the brain's 90% water. Water will always follow the path of least resistance. So will the brain. The brain will always follow a pattern it's most familiar with. So when you just follow your morning ritual or your morning routine, sometimes the, you're actually in an automated position. So you're not learning anything, you're not engaging anything. So Jim taught me to do something different. He taught me to brush my teeth with my non-dominant hand. Stir my cup of tea in the morning with my non-dominant hand. Spoon my breakfast into my mouth with my non-dominant hand. Comb my hair with my non-dominant hand. It feels weird to start with. But I'm actually now more cognitive with my left hand in the last three months than I've ever been in my life, ever. When I start the day, I won't type a message. I won't send an email with my dominant hand. I'll send it with my non-dominant hand, right? So constantly just building new neurological pathways, which has been great for me. I've, I've absolutely loved it. But for me, what does the morning consist of is, is exercise and education. So within that first hour, I want to learn something. Um, and I want, I, I want, not I want, I do learn something. Um, and I go to the gym. Um, now it's not always has to be strictly the gym. Some people don't like this environment that you have to use to exercise but I believe that in with just four minutes and one square meter of space plus your own body weight you would have the ability to raise your heart rate to 170 and that would be my aim within the first hour of my day I want to get my heart rate to 170 and um, that's what I would be aiming to do once I've done that it's about education and gratitude so every single day once a day I send a message to somebody a friend a family member an ex-colleague uh, a sports teammate um, an online influencer and I just give them thanks I say thank you for what you do in life or the advice you've given me or the friendship we have or the support you've offered because um, I find if I can start my day giving the karmic loop demands that the universe will give me back what I'm seeking as well so um, high water intake remember your dreams scribble a couple of my my daily goals, which I, I normally just do in my journal. I just scribble down my day's intentions, um, a little bit of exercise, um, and then from there it's all about nutrition, highly alkalized start to the day, get my greens on board. Um, I'm really big about putting the body into an alkaline state as quickly as I can. Um, and you know, whether it be through your wheatgrass, your barley, your kale, your kiwi fruit, you know, spinach, a um, little bit of apple cider vinegar, a little bit of lemon juice, you know, just try to um, get into my body the right nutrients and vitamins and minerals and hydration that mean I can perform at an elite level all day. It's pretty much what my morning looks like. Yeah, yep. and, and once you've gone through all of that, once you once you've got all that in your system, yeah. um, do you you know how do you, how is your day structured? I mean, we we're just speaking before about. Yeah, there's there's quite a lot of planning around it. Definitely. How do you how do you plan your day, and how many hours in a day does that look like? For sure. So for me, I, th I feel like um, if you use the analogy that a, a rocket ship uses ninety percent of its kerosene in the takeoff process, right? It only uses another ten percent to orbit the entire universe thereafter. So I think the way you start your day is the way your day will continue. So if I can give one practical tip to anybody watching this, remove your snooze button. Don't start I'll your day. That, to be honest, I'm yeah. like. 3.30, 3 4, 4, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. probably something. But you start anyway. your day by procrastinating. So if it's okay to not get up at the time you'd suggested, is it now okay to not send that email, make that phone call, go to that gym? Um, do you get where I'm coming it's from? It's a standard, and that's just how you get For sure. Yeah. You say you're gonna do something, do it, right? Um, but for me, my day is like the first domino. As long as I line my day up, which I tend to do as the last thing in the evening is to prepare my day for the next day, as long as I push the first domino, they'll all fall over thereafter. But um, after I've gymmed, which is usually I get back home in and around that region of about six o'clock. Look, I'm not, I'm not a fit, fast, strong guy. It's more a case of just a bit of physical exertion, get some endorphins running through the body and just make sure that, you know, I am not becoming overweight you know i'm not here to become a bodybuilder but i just don't want to become overweight or sick or lethargic or tired so um i tend to get home at around about six um even at this time of year um, it's cold water cold water is my number one way to engage myself so i'm very fortunate to have a swimming pool at my my property i dive in the pool it is freezing this time of year freezing you can come out with nipples like coat hangers <laughs> you know but um that's just like 
woof, whatever little percentage of the wake up process you needed, that will do it for me now. If I don't want to get in the swimming pool, I'll tend to have a cold shower or at least, you know, a coldish shower. Um, get some nutrition on board and then leave my house. <laughs> it's like the Truman Show, it's pretty much 6.30 on the dot every single day. I don't see you, good afternoon, good evening. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then it's 6.45, 6.45 um, at the office. And it's crazy that 6.45 to 8.30, that hour and 45 minutes before my team starts is hands down, bar none, the most predictive period of my day. And is that just because people aren't around, you can sort of attack those one or two things at least that, that I've need only, to be I've done. only got to focus on me. Yep. This is jack time, yep. you know? Um, Thereafter, from 8.30 until 5 when my team, my team are great, they don't normally leave till 5.30, 6 o'clock, you know, they, I'd say between my office I get thousands of hours of unpaid overtime every year and I guess that's just the culture that we've built. So, um, once they're gone, I then have my 6, um, most days will be sort of 7.30, 8 finish, I'm a kind of, a, I'm roughly about a 13, and, I don't know, 13, 13 and a half hour a day man. Um, Monday to Friday, and then I tend to put my four hours in on the Saturday. So my goal this year is to work less than 70 hours per week. So I'm currently working about 69, 69 and a half um, hours per Doing week. That. Yeah, yeah. Um, but even that last part of the day, it's a lot like, um, I relate everything back to sports. I'm a big sports fan and I'm a big sportsman. Um, it's a lot like that last 10 minutes of a game when you're knackered, but you're just running purely on adrenaline. Mm -hmm. Um, that's what the last hour of my day is like. I've probably got my energy resources at their absolute lowest. Um, I'm due to eat again. Um, and it's more like conclusion, draw some conclusions to the day, delegation, um, what's on the to-do list that others can do for me, and then it's set precedence for tomorrow. So tomorrow's schedule is always written in the last half an hour of my working day so i don't have to take my work home with me and um, i become very good at that i do not take did you my used to do that did you used there to was no separation yeah okay. there was no separation at all but now leaving work at work has created i have a better relationship with my partner i'm, 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 a, I'm a better partner than i've ever been i'm a better brother son than i've ever yeah. been um before and um you, some of you may watch this and not, don't that think that doesn't sound like a good balance, only having yeah. one day off sometimes per week. But um, I play my golf every Sunday, even if I do work my Sunday. Um, I, I play my golf on my Sunday morning. Um, I always tee off first, so I'm, I'm an early bird anyway. But I'll, in the summer, I'll be on that tee box at 5.15 in the morning. Well, everybody else is just getting home from their night out. But um, yeah, I don't drink, so um, yeah, it tends to be watch my sport on my Saturday night, get my head down, play my golf, and um, Sunday's a day for just giving to my family, give myself over, be present, um, working on not having a mobile phone. Um, even if I do have a mobile phone, I will turn off push notifications. Um, I might turn off my emails altogether. Um, and just be present, you know, be present, because they deserve my time and attention too. I think that's that's great that you, that you plan that out and, and you look to do that, because um, I think uh, you know, something that everyone that's starting a business or has a business, it, it just it does consume you. It does, does take up a, a, does. Lot, a lot of your time. How, how have you found, um, how did you sort of find that balance between mm. your work and your home? Like obviously having a partner, they've got to, that they would have to realize, but it doesn't mean that you, you're not giving to them at all. No, it can't be no, one way. How, no. how, do you, how do you deal with, with all of that? Yeah, I just think it's, um, it's two options. One is to involve them. If you can bring them into the discussion about your business and they can feel like they're contributing or they can have an opinion that holds validity, they may become as obsessed or addicted or engaged as you are. But if it's like my relationship where I don't know the first thing about nursing, I just don't. And, and you know, you can talk about the musculoskeletal system and you know, but I can start talking about the intricacies of neuro-linguistic programming, body language, tonality, behavioral sciences, negotiation strategies, and it's the same for her. So unfortunately, we don't share that. So instead, what we decide to do is to have a debrief. We spend 10, 15 minutes where we just get shit off our chest. We don't want an opinion. I'm not asking you for your opinion. I'm just, I'm just outwardly letting, getting it out of my body. And then we just have a set period, and usually it's the second that, me and my partner have got this really funny thing where we 
tag forks when we're about to eat, right? We've just always done it. Whenever we're sat at a meal, we tag forks and then we start eating. At that point when we tag forks from there for the rest of the evening, it's no longer business orientated, it's family orientated from here. It's about um, continuing to engage each other socially and yeah. give a shit about you know, whatever they're looking to achieve outside of a professional capacity. And do you think going about it that way, it, it means like, yes, I am gonna have this ridiculously busy life at mm -hmm. times, but Here's our time. Nothing's going to break that. You can you can bet for the sure. bottom dollar on this happening. For is sure. That, is that more for or sure. less it? Set it aside, like anything, you know. Um, if your time's everyone's time, then it's no one's time, if that makes sense. The same as in an office, if a task's everyone's task, it's no one's task, right? So for me, it's about, yeah, set it in stone, Sunday, 10 o'clock, we're going to go for breakfast at this place. At one o'clock, we're going to go for a walk down at this beach. Six o'clock, we're gonna go for dinner at this place, you know, whatever it might be. But just like you do with work, when you set your goals and you set your schedule, some people don't like the idea. My, my sister's one of these. She hates the idea of having a plan, right, of a day. But sometimes if you don't plan the time, even if you don't plan what you're gonna do with the time, if you don't plan the time, the time just never f actually happens. So yeah, just giving, giving yourself over um, and also setting aside the, like for, for us, we've got, we've got a week. In the last week of September, I've got the whole week, just me and my partner. But when you do, just come off grid a little bit. Like you, if you're sat with them, do you really need to be commenting on social media with some other friends' posts and stuff, you know? Like, I think that's, that's the biggest thing, is get rid of the remote control of a human being, re remove this, connect old school again, you know? Look them in the eyes, have a chat, give a shit. You know, I think that what takes sometimes a long time to create the opportunity one day together and you can truly fall back in love and remind yourself why that person's a big part of your love. Cool, yeah. well, I think that's a great, um, a great attitude to have toward, towards that because you know, a lot of people I talk to and, and, and myself, you know, you sort of go through that with your, your friends or family. And it can be a tough thing sort of, because you know that they're probably not going to think like you, yeah, but yeah. you still have to like appreciate sure. that that's just not what they're about no, and no. you hopefully appreciate that they see those De things in you. Definitely. In you. Like even for me, if I, when I'm talking to somebody, do you, know, you ever had this conversation where someone's sending the message and they keep looking up at you? Mm. I just stop. Yeah. If that's important, do it. Mm. Now put it away. Now let's talk. Um, I've got this thing where if I, my family now, if they, we sit down at a table together and their phone's on the table, I'll put it on the floor. <laughs> like this. If we go out for dinner now with my family, we do the thing that we saw on, on some social media where we all put our phone in the middle, we stack them all up, and the first person to touch it has to pay the bill. <laughs> yeah, I've if, done that if, before. If, no, if nobody touches it, we split the bill as we would have anyway, you yeah. know, but suddenly they're all there, and you actually see people sort of go, oh no, oh, yeah. oh no, wait, I can't. <laughs> and it's just become such an, an, a motor neuron thing we do is to grab our phone that, um, yeah, I just think be a fraction more conscious of it. No phones in bed. Um, I don't, I don't know if this is about my sex life, but you know, not having, doing this all night until you're tired, going to bed, no TV in the room, you know, no phones. I spend that last 10 minutes talking and bonding and you know, I think that's what a stable, healthy relationship is based out of. Yeah, I think that's, that's pretty relevant and, and the fact that the phones are so powerful, they allow to, allow us to do such great things, but mm. we need to be utilizing them in the way that For sure. we should be. For sure. I mean, you can't blame the, the knife because the you know someone robbed a, a, a 7-eleven no, with the knife no, it's no you can use a knife to cut food and, and eat with so get it i yeah i'm sort of big on that as well yeah. um of using using them for what they're there for yeah and not seeing them as either completely evil or com completely the thing that you need to for have sure. in your hand all and time. it's it's the, that idea that it's never the right time to do the wrong thing and it's never the wrong time to do the right thing do you know so you wouldn't eat ice cream for breakfast you wouldn't wear no t-shirt in the middle of winter in Canberra, you know? So it's like, it's, it's no different for me. Just, you need to choose the moments where it's appropriate to be a part of your life. And for the others, you just need to abandon it. You know, I feel like we're the most connected generation that are so disconnected as people. It's, it's, it, it baffles me. So yeah, um, I love people. I love being present. And um, although I'm, I'm not saying I'm an angel, I'm guilty for using this thing a, a yeah, lot, but yeah, the, the fact that I'm conscious of it is making making me a lot more aware, for sure. I think the key for, for myself and, you know, the, the way that I connected with Ryan as well is a good example. I mean, we're in a similar Facebook group. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, he was commenting on things that I was and I'm like, yeah, this guy looks like someone who could for be sure. really interesting. So sure. I think that, that, that that's a good example of, of how, you, how you can use it. You know, I, 
I took a, an online um, friendship um, offline, offline and that's it. you know and, and, and grow it for sure that, so, for sure for yeah. sure I, I think that's a, a great thing is about finding ways to word of mouth has become word of mouth yes. and I want to take although that can be how you meet somebody um, it's about then taking that back into the fundamentals of relationships which is two humans connecting um, you know on a personal and professional level for sure well Look, I want to thank you for coming on today, Jack. Um, it's been a pleasure. pleasure appreciate to have it. you on, Matt. Yeah, thank you for um, your time. No, not, not at all. Uh, I appreciate you, you coming on. And I've learned a lot just in this last sort of hour and a half. Cool. I'm sure everyone listening and watching uh, will get a lot of out, out of it too. So just to finish off, uh, like it's been a whirlwind few months for you, really. Oh, um, yeah. But by anyone's sort of expectation. Yeah. And I just want to I just want to know where to from here. Yeah. yeah where, where, where do we go to from here? Look, I love it, mate. Great question. And um, it has been a whirlwind. Um, it definitely has. And we understand that it will calm. You know, there'll be a little bit of calm after the storm. Yeah. But um, for us now, the future is very clear. Um, it's very definite. It's a pathway to becoming the number one training organisation, specifically sales training organisation in Australia. Um, over the next two years, we are going to have a thousand clients on our subscription service. So we offer a really high quality um, sales training digital program, which is just 250 bucks per week for a business. That gives you access for 25 of your staff to utilize it. So less than $2 per working day per person. Um, and we'll be at the stage in two years time where we have a thousand businesses on that subscription. So that'll be a $12.5 million revenue stream for us. Um, and at that point is when we will expand internationally. So um, we've obviously only ever been a Gold Coast business for the last three years. We've now stepping into the national space, which is exciting. Um, and then in the next three years, we take that national entity and we make it an international entity. And it's quite simple. Um, when you talk sales right now, you hear the word Grant Cardone. You talk, you type in sales training. He actually has seven of the top 10 spaces on Google revolve around Grant Cardone. So it's great. We know who we're chasing. And um, five years from now, you say the word sales and you'll hear Jack Corbett, Ryan Tuckwood, ISR. That's brilliant, mate. I love the I love the focus, I love the vision, I love the attitude. So thanks again for coming on. And thanks everyone for, for dropping by, whether you're listening in your cars or wherever, wherever you are at the moment or if you're tuning in watching the videos. Uh, yeah, it's been great to have Jack on tell his story. If you want to follow Jack, I'll put some information there. Um, you probably won't find him on Instagram. No, no, Instagram's want... not my handle. <laughs> LinkedIn would be the place to, so, to catch up with me. There you go, yeah. LinkedIn. LinkedIn is the way. And uh, yeah, once again, thanks everyone for, for stopping by, having a listen or a watch. And thank you, Jack. Cheers. Thank you, my man. Thanks, guys. And Cheers, we'll see you buddy. next time.